I'm Nick Offerman. I'm Jimmy DeResta. This is Jimmy. Maybe you've heard of him. He's kind of a big deal. This is Jimmy's hand. Look right here. Graphic images coming in three, two, one. That was like the first thing in my mind was, I absolutely can't believe I just stepped on the side of the line that I can't come back from. That's, that was the first thought in my mind. What did it feel like to have your finger cut off? Oh boy, it was uh, it was pretty rough. I had, I had fallen down and the blade kind of entered here first and then pulled my hand in like that. So like I, wow. I felt my, fa- my hand get like stubbed on the blade like that, as if like I stubbed my toe. And I was like, don't look at it too much because I don't want to faint. I'm here alone. And I reached around. I had to shut my exhaust fan off. I had to shut the lights off. I had to, of course, shut the saw off. The nurses said, we have to wash it out. This, I got there at about 6.30 to the hospital. And it wasn't until like midnight that the doctors finally came over and said, okay, we're going to wash it out now. And the pain was so severe at that point. The washing Yeah, because it was a more. squirt bottle. It was a squirt bottle. So like oh. the pressure of the, of the saline squirting on my hand was excruciating to the point where I fainted. A table saw doesn't care if you're a maker celebrity like Jimmy or a beginner, it can change your life faster than you have time to react. You already know this, but what you might not know is that every year there are over 700,000 brand new table saws sold in the United States alone. On average, 51,000 people have an accident at the table saw every year and 33,000 of those people have to go to the ER. 4,000 leave with an amputation. And if you average that out, it's 11 amputations a day. Every two hours, one woodworker loses their fingers at the table saw. I had no idea that it was that bad. It's so bad that over $2 billion is spent annually addressing the medical treatments of these accidents. Now you may be thinking, okay, I'll break down and just buy a saw stop. Hold on, Sparky. A saw stop is great. Sure, your hot dogs will be safe, but a saw stop can't prevent kickback, and kickback is the number one cause of injury at the table saw. I personally know someone who was knocked out because of kickback at the table saw. One minute, they're ripping a piece. The next minute, they wake up in a pool of blood. Their teeth are knocked out. The saw is still running. They still had their digits, but kickback knocked them out. A saw stop isn't gonna prevent that. In this video, I'm gonna share with you over 21 of the common mistakes beginners and pros make at the table saw. Some of them are common sense, some of them are downright crazy, but they've all been done. And the crazy thing is, Jimmy made two of these mistakes at the same time when he cut his pinky off. At the end of our time together, you'll be armed with a lot of the knowledge that you're going to need to keep yourself out of the ER and to keep your shorts clean. And even if you know all these things, this video will be a great reminder and refresher because the people most at risk at the table saw aren't just beginners, it's also professionals and people who have a lot of time at the table saw. Beginners and then experienced users. Who's more at risk of getting hurt at the table saw? I I would probably say experienced users. Jimmy had been using the table saw for over 20 years when he had his accident. None of us are exempt from this. This video is broken down into three sections. The blade, your setup, and material handling. 92% of all accidents that landed in the ER were because of, shocker, touching the blade. Now obviously, nobody intentionally tries to touch that spinny thing. So these first eight mistakes all center around what you need to know about the blade and how to keep yourself safe. Sometimes when you're ripping a board, the kerf can close up and pinch the back of the blade, especially if there's tension in the wood. Best case, this stalls your motor. Worst case, it kicks back and launches the piece towards you faster than you can process and react. That's why you always want a riving knife installed. Now this thin piece of metal sits in line with the back of the blade and it prevents the wood from pinching and binding the blade. Older saws don't have a riving knife and there's a way that you can get around that. You can get aftermarket splitter kits to install on your throat plate. Microjig has a good one. Frank, who's one of my favorite woodworkers on YouTube, has an incredible video on how he made one. I'll link to that below. Now, even if you have a riving knife, you may not be safe. This kind of goes without saying, but I honestly have never thought about this. Make sure your riving knife is connected. My friend, Tiny Sean, recently shared this experience. The other scary one was the riving knife coming loose and bouncing off the blade a few times before slamming the stop button. Check your riving knife. I will never use a table saw if it doesn't have a riving knife.
I've always thought a zero clearance insert was more for finish quality because it prevents splintering, but there's another purpose, and it's to keep small parts from falling down into the blade, potentially launching those things back at you. I never thought about this until my friend Alyssa told me what happened to her. Hey Drew, I have done some dumb things using power tools, and one of them is not using a zero clearance throat plate insert on my table saw. So when I am squaring up a board, especially boards with the epoxy on them, I will push it through and the sliver is so perfectly sized, it will go down into the slot and shoot back at me and three times has hit me in the shoulder and the face. Thank goodness I was wearing glasses. And no, I still don't have a zero clearance insert on this thing. There's a cheap way to fix this if you don't have a zero clearance plate. You can get this fast cap tape that is really cheap. It's mostly used for miter saws, but I've seen people cover their throat plate with this when they're in a pinch. Now, obviously you're probably gonna want a better solution than that fast cap tape. And sometimes the aftermarket solutions are really expensive. I've seen zero clearance inserts sell for over $80 or more. I was recently a guest on another Woodshop podcast and I met Dan who actually makes these zero clearance inserts out of hardwood in his garage. Normally, I wouldn't promote this, but because I saw him choke on air, like, true story, I figured we should probably help him out. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. He's dying. Pete, get over Keep there. Going. The worst part is I'm not even eating a hot dog. I choked uh, on air, you guys. So I'll leave a link down below. It's not an affiliate link. I won't make any money on this. If you want to help support a guy who can't breathe, go check out his stuff. And if you want to save some money, he made a discount code just for you that will save you 10% off. Again, not sponsored. I'm not making any money on this. The code is, I'm not lying, Mike Coffee Sucks. Sorry, Mike. A lot of people make the mistake of standing in the line of fire. Check out the story from my friend Sam. Have you ever wondered what it's like to get punched directly in the stomach? Well, if you're not cautious using your table saw, it'll show you. How do I know? from experience. One time I was cutting a piece of wood on my first table saw and the blade and the wood were not getting along that got all bound up together and that blade launched that piece directly into the wall behind me, hitting my pegboard and breaking my pegboard. Luckily though, I was standing slightly over to the side when cutting so the piece of wood narrowly missed me, but that was a scary experience and zero out of 10, I do not recommend it for anyone. It's best practice to stand on one side of the blade or the other. I typically stand to the left of the blade because I'm pushing with my right hand. Just make sure you're never in the line of fire. Check out the story from my friend Jeffrey. I make sure I'm always off to the side and not directly in the line of fire. There are a couple of dents in the drywall in my garage. Don't stand in the line of fire. Having the wrong tooth count is another mistake that can potentially lead to other issues which will lead to an injury. I'm really embarrassed to admit this, but for a long time, like until about two years ago, I never paid attention to the tooth count and the grain direction of my blade. I made the mistake of thinking the more expensive a blade is and the more teeth it has, the better it is. The problem is most of the cuts I do at the table saw are ripping cuts. And when you're ripping going with the grain, you actually don't want a high tooth count like a 60 or 80 tooth blade. You want a lower tooth count like a 24 tooth. There's a whole lot of reasons and physics and heat. The Old Testament cat Yo, did an incredible video breaking down in slow motion with different tooth counts, angles, and the different size of gullets do. I'll link to that. But the short of it is this, if you do mostly ripping, get a ripping blade. If you do mostly cross cutting, get a cross cutting blade. Not all blades are created equal. Make sure you're using the right tooth count. And the reason why this is a safety thing is if you're using a cross cut blade like I used to do to do ripping, you're going to dull that blade. That blade is gonna have more heat than it was designed to have. It's gonna get dirty and it will introduce more friction than needed. And you don't want friction at the table saw. Ideally, you would have a collection of ripping blades and crosscut blades, or if you can only afford one, get a GP or general purpose blade or a combination blade if you do a mix of both and you can't afford two blades. Most beginners set their blade too high. They just raise it all the way up even if they're cutting half inch or three quarter inch material. It's completely unnecessary and obviously, the more the blade is exposed, the more you're at risk. A good rule that I follow and that a lot of people follow is that for most people, in most situations, you want the bottom of the topmost gullet to be at the height of your material. That will clear out the waste and give you the right angle. There's an incredible video from Jody at Inspire Woodcraft where he breaks down the ideal height and, and when you want to break those rules. 
But for most people in most situations, set your blade like this. And while we're on the subject, it's also good practice to learn how to tune up your table saw and to do that every six to 12 months. You can invest in an accurate saw gauge that will help you determine if your arbor is aligned to your miter slots and to your fence. It's well worth the money. For years, I had no idea that my table saw was massively out of alignment. And as soon as I corrected it, the friction that I constantly felt at the table saw went away. I could rip blades cleanly and the burning that I used to get went away. I had no idea that my blade was out of alignment with my miter slot. You can get expensive options like this woodpecker one that I paid for. You can get cheaper ones. I've tested the Rockler one. It's pretty good too. You can also make a shop made one. You don't have to spend a lot of money to do this, but if you're going to use the table saw a lot, make sure your blade is in alignment. While we're on that subject, make sure the nut on your blade is tight. Check out the story from Mark. I turned off my saw one day and noticed the blade kept spinning for a long time afterwards. When I had a look, the nut had come loose and the blade wasn't attached. I dread to think how bad that could have been. I have never thought about checking the tightness of the nut at the blade, but from now on, I always will. Thank you, Mark, for sharing that. Setting the blade height while the saw is running. This is actually how Jimmy cut his finger off. He was doing a rabbit cut. And I cut one side of the rabbit and I was getting the saw set up to cut the other side of the rabbit while it was running. That was my mistake. I had never locked the, the fence and I was in the process of raising the blade up and it kissed the piece of wood that was just on the back side of the blade. I was raising it up to see how deep and I was raising the blade up like this to see how hot it would come to meet the other slice in the in the rabbit that had already been installed in the wood. And, and I raised it up too far and it grabbed the wood and shot the wood through the saw and hit me in my forearm. And so my adjustment hand that was raising the blade up got blasted by the four foot piece of one by two. And so I got blasted by that piece of wood at the exact same time my hand went like this and I bumped into the blade. And I hadn't locked the fence so everything moved in the big boom. Like, and I, boom, and my hand hit the blade, I felt my hand like if you were to like tap your wrist on like a buffing wheel and you'd feel your, your hand get yanked like that. Yeah. I had, I had fallen down and the blade kind of entered here first and then pulled my hand in like that. So like I, wow. I felt my, fa my hand get like stubbed on the blade like that as if like I stubbed my toe. So now I'm, I'm blasted here by the long piece of wood that jammed through the saw and my pinky was in my palm. And I looked at this first and then I felt my pinky in my palm. I was like, what's going on here? And in an instant, both arms were incapacitated to some extent. I thought I broke my forearm because the wood hit so hard right here. And then I said, all right, I, I, I can move my hand. My, my arm's not broken. Let me tend to this. And so I grabbed a bandana and I wrapped this after I noticed it was like sliced and everything. And I was like, don't look at it too much because I don't want to faint. I'm here alone. And I reached around. I had to shut my exhaust fan off. I had to shut the lights off. I had to of course, shut the saw off and go upstairs the whole time. Like, okay, what do I need? I need my keys. I need my phone. This might be a one-way trip. Well, that was interesting. If you want to see my entire conversation with Jimmy, I think it's about 40 minutes long. I'll put a link to it on my second channel. It's well worth the watch. Number seven, not cleaning your saw blade. I'm embarrassed to say that I have used a dirty blade for a long time just because I don't feel like cleaning it. But a dirty blade is a dangerous blade. Not only will it give you bad quality cuts, it will introduce unnecessary heat and friction into your process leading to other problems. The ironic thing is the fix is pretty cheap. Someone actually makes a $100 blade cleaning kit. You don't need that. The reality is all you need is a $2 five gallon bucket lid. That's what I use. I got this stuff called Super Clean from Walmart that's highly concentrated. I put one cap of this into a larger bucket of water. I let the blade soak for a couple of minutes. I take a brush, I scrub off all the resin and I'm good to go. You don't need to spend $100 to clean your blade. I've heard of some people who've used oven cleaner. I've never done that. Whatever you gotta do, just clean your blade and you don't have to spend a lot of money doing it. Installing the blade backwards. Now, I can't believe that I actually have to talk about this, but when I first got my table saw, I had to think about the direction of the blade. And I remember when I was a little kid learning with like a utility knife that you always wanna cut away from you and just that was ingrained in me. You always want the blade going away from you. And when I got my table saw, I almost put the blade on backwards thinking, oh yeah, you want the teeth to go away from you because that's the safest way to cut. I don't even, I can't even imagine what would happen if you tried to cut backwards on the table saw. Pay attention to the rotation arrow on the blade. You, you want the teeth facing you. Don't put your blade on backwards. Having the wrong shop layout can actually lead to injuries. Don't position your tool where you can't see the doorway or where someone could sneak up beside you or behind you. 
The last thing you want is to be distracted in the middle of a cut. I've taken this a step further and I've taught my wife and my children that if they hear a power tool running in the garage, not to enter. But there's been a lot of times when I'm working at the table saw and my kids run in and automatically start screaming, talking to me, asking me a question, and I'm trying to cut something. So it's taken some effort to train them that that's a very dangerous thing to do. And sometimes I even lock the door. If you neglect the surface of your table saw, it can lead to problems beyond just cosmetic. I remember buying my first nice cast iron table saw and then freaking out after someone put a drink on it and it started to rust. Now, I've used paste wax for a long time, but there are three problems that I have with it. First, my favorite paste wax, you can't even find anymore. Second, it doesn't really last that long. It only lasts for about a month, depending on how you use it. And shocker, I never reapply it because when I'm in the shop, I don't want to be maintaining my tools. I want to be making things. The third problem I have with paste wax is it actually doesn't really make my tools as slick as I want them to be. Now the good news is there's this new graphite nanotechnology that I have found to be significantly better than the traditional paste wax method. I'm sure you've heard about carbon method and carbon coat. It's fantastic. This protective coating lasts anywhere from six to 12 months depending on your use. Now where this product shines is if you have an old table saw, you can use their system to bring the cast iron surface back to bare metal and almost pristine condition. Then you apply several layers of their graphene carbon coat. And if you really want, the next day you can spray this carbon glide on. And when I did it on my table saw, it turned my table saw into an air hockey table. Look at how slick this thing is. But when it comes to your table saw, you want as little friction as possible. Slick is safe. What's also cool about this carbon coat stuff is you can apply it to your bandsaw, your jointer, even your hand planes. I'm now looking for things to carbon coat. I'll leave a link down below if you wanna learn more about them. Never work in the wrong frame of mind. A big mistake that gets a lot of people injured has nothing to do with the tool itself, but your frame of mind. It is a bad idea to operate any power tool if you're not at a calm, centered, peaceful state. If you're hungry, if you're angry, if you're tired, if you're stressed, if you're in a rush, if you're feeling anxiety, if you need to go to the bathroom. I mean, I've never done the potty dance at the table saw. If you're not in the frame of mind and you wanna work in your workshop, use a hand tool, get a hand plane, don't use a table saw if you're not in the right frame of mind. It might be a good idea to not listen to a podcast when using a table saw. Check out this story. Cut my pinky half through, that got stitched back. It's funny how it happened. I was listening to the mushroom guy, Paul, on JRE, and it was so fascinating that I forgot to lift my left hand enough above the blade. It's for that reason and that reason alone that I don't listen to podcasts in the shop if I'm using power tools. And it's not just your mind that you pay attention to when you're in a shop, also pay attention to your body and your body position. Check out this story from Omar. I was once paying too much attention to the contact of the plywood I was cutting to the fence and got unaware of my left hand position when I realized my thumb was running about two millimeters from the blade. Nothing happened, but I got scared enough to never be unaware of my whole body position before a cut again. Yeah, this one's kind of nuts. Uh, if you trip a breaker, make sure you turn your saw off. Corey shared, my saw quit working in the middle of a very thin, long rib cut. In the troubleshooting process, I found a tripped breaker. Flipped the breaker on, saw was still on. Not too dangerous, but scared the out of me. You can imagine, if you've got other people in the shop and that happens, you get someone else hurt because you didn't turn the saw off. This person says, I've been fortunate but have had close calls, almost had something hit me in the eye yesterday, had forgotten to drop my glasses. I never wear safety glasses at the table saw and I'm going to start. Don't wear loose clothing and don't wear gloves. The gloves can catch the blade and suck your hand in. Wear safety glasses, wear a mask, wear hearing protection. It's not sexy, but take care of your body. Remember, your hand is not a push stick. <laughs> Before you make any cut, Think through how you're gonna apply three different ways of pressure. Downward pressure, sideways pressure, and forward pressure. It's natural to think of using your hands, but that's asking for it. Now, even if you do have a push stick, there's one problem with using a push stick, and that is if you push like this, you will actually pull up on the board. And it's for that reason that most of the time I use what's called a push shoe. You can buy them, you can make them. I first made one out of a two by four with a notch in it, and then I made a better one from a free template I found online. 
For most of my cuts, I use a combination of this push shoe and a push stick that's used on the side. If I'm using repeated cuts, I'll use a feather board. I like these foam feather boards better than the hard plastic ones. If you don't feel like making a push shoe, I got this cool one from A Glimpse Inside. And if you're cutting small parts, the gripper is well worth the price in that it supports both the main piece and the off cut. It provides everything you need. There's a reason why these are some of the most popular push sticks, push shoes, gripper things in woodworking. Well worth the investment. Never try to cross cut a narrow piece using the rip fence. It's called a rip fence, not a cross cut fence. And unfortunately, a lot of beginners make this mistake and you're asking for a problem when you do this. It's best to use a miter gauge and if you need to make repeated cuts, clamp a board at your fence for reference and then push in or use a cross cut sled. I'm shocked at how many times I see people not have an outfeed table or outfeed support or even in feed for that matter. Check out this video from my friend, John Schieser. He's cutting a tapered piece on a sled with clamps, but he has no way to support the piece on the outside. Here's a really cool outfeed table that I made that includes scrap bin storage and an extra table that flips up Jay Bates has a really cool video that just came out where he shows a, a fast and cheap way to make in-feed and out-feed supports. And of course, Izzy Swan, if you have a saw stop, surely you know about his genius in-feed support clamp jig thing that he brilliantly designed. If you haven't thought about out-feed or in-feed, you need to. I was recently at WorkbenchCon and at dinner, someone asked, raise your hand if you've ever free-handed a piece at the table saw as if it were a bandsaw. And I was shocked at the number of people who raised their hand. Eric Spensley was one of them. Yeah, a couple years ago, I was trying to make a really just quick cut. So I came to the table saw and I didn't really know any better. And I ran a piece freehand through it. That was a bad idea. All right, Drew, I got to get going. I got to build a new project. It's actually for Jason Bent because he doesn't know how to woodwork. I actually have to build all this stuff for him. But see ya. Peace. Please. Don't freehand at the table saw. Not locking the fence down. You'd be surprised how many people forget to lock the fence down. I'm actually a little embarrassed to admit this, but just last week, I forgot to lock down my fence. I was in here with my imperial ruler trying to get this exact measurement. Forgot to lock down the fence, started pushing my material through, and the fence started wandering. Total boat, baby! Always lock your fence down. This should go without saying, but don't try to cut crooked or warped or cupped boards at the table saw. If you have to do that, use a sled with a clamp or use a track saw. Ignoring nails or screws that are in the board is another mistake. Check out this story from Chris. I was making a box. I needed to separate the lid from the base. I basically made a cube and I was cutting it on the table saw. And after doing that, I realized Huge mistake, because there were brad nails inside. One of those brad nails shot up and hit me right in the neck. And honestly, I didn't know what to do. It was sticking right out here. Wasn't bleeding, but I had to go into the restroom, get a pair of pliers, actually pull it out, because I couldn't pull it out manually. Um, scary moment. Just be careful what's in the wood you're cutting, especially when you put it there. Remember that it's there, because you never know what's gonna come flying out your way. Not pushing the material past the blade. This one seems kind of obvious, but a lot of beginners do this, is you will cut a board and then you'll just leave it there and then go do something else or go grab a push stick or go grab another board to push through. Never leave a board unsupported when it's near or making contact with a blade. Push all the way through. I'm not going to ask you to subscribe or even like this video, but what I am gonna do is if you know a woodworker or someone who has a table saw and you think that they should hear the message that's in this video, would you consider sharing this with them so that we can spread more awareness of how to stay safe?